Hey, Blood Ever Intent fam. Flat Earth fam. If you're just researching uh, Flat Earth fam, if you're looking for, you know, truth seeking fam, you know, everyone's my fam. Like a big brother, we wake, or big sister, we wake up the younger ones, you know, that haven't uh, completely uh, woken up yet, you know, whether it be with kind, loving words or, hey, you're a fucking retard, you know, but it's out of love. So today uh, I want to, this video is directed to those people who understand and um, pretty much I want to brush up on Lucy's Trust. I'm going to do immense research on Lucy's Trust because um, supposedly um, that's going to, that's gonna, according to Quasi Luminous, that's going to pay for our trip. Okay, Lucy's Trust sounds so bad because they work with the UN and all that shit, but I think it deserves more inquiry and more research. You know, maybe even visiting the location, you know, because at the end of the day, you'll see that they're only working with the UN because they're the only ones doing something in the world. So my, my, um, my theory is that if we get enough people and show, you know, that some energy that we're, we're up to something, you know. We have all the money in the world or not, you know, we have to get there or, you know, the means to get there, to get everyone there. It's not about money. It's getting there, getting, getting all our people there, you know, at this certain time and date. So that's what it's about. It's about, you know, getting us there, you know. So just because they're tied with the UN, that doesn't really mean anything. I think it deserves more inquiry. So we're going to do that right now. Uh, it only takes 30 minutes of your time, so if you want to skip through some things, that's fine. But do your own research is what I want to fucking draw from this video. So, we'll be watching it and I'll be giving my commentary on it. What I think from, you know, connecting the pieces. You know, we learn connecting the dots. Well, that's, the, that's one of the first activities we learn, connecting the dots. But I think as people get older, they forget to know how to connect the dots. They forget how to connect the dots, even though that's the first thing we ever learned growing up, the little kitty activities, you know, even those games are a psyop, those little kitty games that they give us, you know, the little toys and shit, the hula hoops and all that, the, the basketball, you know, like all this shit, you know, was, it, it, it's put there for a reason, all right, so enjoy the video. activities of the Lucius Trust, founded by Allison Foster Bailey, is dedicated to establishing human relations by promoting the education of the human mind towards recognition and practice of the spiritual principles and values upon which a stable and interdependent world society may be based. Like Alice Bailey, Sarah McKechnie is taking her professional and spiritual journey through life with her husband, Dale McKechnie, who is Vice President of the Lucius Trust. Sarah McKechnie, I can only imagine that you've been asked. So pretty much, she's, uh, she's being interviewed. The President of Lucius Trust is being interviewed. Um, so let's try, to, let's try to read between the lines here. Thousands of times to speak on the history of Lucius Trust founder Alice Bailey. But before I ask you to do this, I would like you to reach farther back into history and give us an overview of Alice Bailey's Russian mentor, Madame Helena Blavatsky, and why Bailey looked to her for inspiration. Madame Blavatsky, as she's called, or sometimes referred to as HPB, her initials, was a real pioneer in the... Um, bring uh, she wrote a book called The Secret Doctrine, and she's pretty much like behind a lot of like ideas as you'll see like she's written a lot of uh, esoteric works <clears throat> and also you know she and like um, Hitler was inspired by Blatsky a lot of like um, people were um, you know influenced by her work 
let's just say she's like the first modern occultist from my understanding i could be completely wrong but from my understanding she's like you know one of the first modern occultists probably you know what's called the ageless wisdom to the west the ageless wisdom is yeah, I see. She's talking about it. It's a term for the spiritual teaching that, for most of human history, was hidden or veiled. But it's uh, it's like a, a golden thread that runs throughout the world religions and mythologies and has always been present in human consciousness in some form or another appropriate for the time. Then in about... 1875, uh, a Russian woman, Madame Blavatsky, who had traveled extensively throughout the East and studied with spiritual teachers who were in remote locations in Tibet, in Egypt, deep in South America. She traveled all over, which was extraordinary for a woman in those times. Quotes by Blavatsky. One of the most hidden truths no hidden secrets involved in the so-called fall of angels satan and his rebellious host will thus prove to have become the direct saviors and creators of divine man just like what uh, quasi luminous has been saying satan and his rebellious host the rebellious host will thus prove to have become the direct saviors the direct saviors and creators of divine man. Thus Satan, once he has ceased to be viewed in the superstitious spirit of the church. See, the church has been, you know, this makes sense. The church has twisted everything. Everything has been a reversal of truth. You know, everybody says Satan, oh, negative. Let me X my mind, evil. Like, let me not get into it. Satan, oh, oh my God. Like, immediately when we heard, when we hear Satan, our brains just shut off and we don't want to think rationally. We just like, oh no, that's evil. Bye. Like fucking uh, robots and shit. So pretty much once he ceases to be viewed in the superstitious spirit of the church. Grows into grand Jewish image. It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god. Satan or Lucifer. Lucifer. Uh, the black sun represents the the centrifugal energy of the universe this ever-living symbol of self-sacrifice for intellectual independence of humanity so pretty much i've also read that the fallen angels are always looked up in a bad light by christianity but the fallen angels fell from their from their beautiful nature to rise us up to help rise us up to where they are That's um, that's what I think about the fallen angels, and you can watch uh, the movie Noah, the one uh, about the ark and shit. The fallen angels actually help Noah in building the ark. So I think you know, I think maybe the names are mislabeled, but definitely this deserves more um, conscious awareness research. You know, so definitely I'll be doing that. This is very fucking interesting. This ever living symbol of self sacrifice for the intellectual independence of humanity. So they had to, they, they're pretty much going down to reach us to bring us up. That's pretty much like my idea of what I've looked at so far. I, as, as I collect more information, you know, my view will definitely change. Let's see, let's see. Times wrote a work that's called The Secret Doctrine, and it was really fundamental in bringing the ageless wisdom into Western consciousness. Alice Bailey herself discovered The Secret Doctrine when she was living in California. Her own personal story is very interesting. She was um, a divorced woman with three small daughters to raise, and through a series of extraordinary events, she discovered The Secret Doctrine and was put in touch with two students who had studied personally under Madame Blavatsky. And so Alice Bailey became uh, deeply uh, engrossed in the study of the ageless wisdom and became an expert on the... So Alice Bailey started on uh, the, the, the Lucius Trust uh, Fund and they also have a library. Um, 
pretty much the I think the movie Alice in Wonderland is about Alice Bailey because you're gonna learn later that that uh, she loves reading books she loves reading books and the girl in Alice in Wonderland also likes reading books like you see her reading a book in the park and then she falls asleep when she's reading it doesn't tell you what she's reading I don't I don't think so I'm not sure but whatever she falls asleep pretty much reading so I think uh, Alice in Wonderland is really about Alice Bailey uh, I'm gonna look into that more secret doctrine and began to teach it herself so yes you're right Blavatsky was in many ways Alice Bailey's mentor even though they never knew each other. you know right here uh, Lucifer the North Star is right above where we need to go for everlasting life you know that's North Star that's Lucifer the one that points the way out is it true that uh, Blavatsky's writings might have been plagiarized or at the very least served to inspire the recent best-selling book The Secret I don't know I am not terribly familiar with that book if you have survived this long in the in my interview or not me watching this interview you're gonna learn that she's also gonna ask about the New World Order so keep watching you know I've heard of it I think that some of the print I'll put the link in the video like at the bottom of the description principles in the book The Secret are fairly well anchored ideas that are really part of the ageless wisdom and therefore part of the library that humanity has been given. I, don't, I wouldn't use the word plagiarized which suggests stolen just rephrased for modern man. I understand uh, this, please, okay, this, I, I view it as a deception. I don't view Lucifer as not a fucking masculine. Where's the fucking goddess in this equation? Lucifer is, you know, we know it's a feminine goddess. It does not have and a man both hand. Madame Blavatsky and Alice Bailey's <laughs> mothers died like when they were young girls. Girl and and because death is life's greatest mystery that can't truly be explained even though traditional religion attempts to do just that do you think that the death of these women's mothers could have been the catalysts that set them on a path to esoteric study that's an interesting question i'd never thought of it that way quite possibly it's true alice bailey in her uh, autobiography which is called the unfinished autobiography because she died before she completed it does talk about her childhood and uh, in fact she was orphaned both her mother and father died before i think she was even 10 years old and uh, it was devastating for her as it would be for any child of that age she was passed back and forth between different parts of her family and that had a big impact on her spiritual development because as I understand it every summer she would be shipped off to her grandmother in Scotland who was quite a um, fundamentalist Christian and Alice imbibed the fundamentalist Christian doctrine of her grandmother so deeply that as a young woman she was very narrow-minded in her own words a rabid evangelist and went to India to preach the Christian doctrine to British soldiers in India but as she discovered they were more interested in um... and honestly who the fuck knows if these people even exist you know it's a cover of a cover but it's you have to look into it somehow you gotta start somewhere you know you gotta start somewhere like who knows if these people are even real like supposedly there's this theory that Hitler is uh, Walt Disney you know <laughs> like just because it sounds crazy don't dismiss it look into it you know look into it look into it drinking cocoa and playing chess with her than listening to sermons expand on Billy's biographical data for me that would be great because I think it's a pretty interesting story she had you know her first husband and who was abusive and that's the sort of thing that women are still dealing with today to go on to become such a, a, a great and interesting woman I suppose all of us are a product 
of our life experiences, and Alice Bailey certain, certainly was. She was an orphan. That's fundamental. She was born in the Victorian era of England. That's fundamental to her character. She was born to a life of privilege, and that also is fundamental. She never went to a school. She was tutored privately, and she had a first-class education and an incredibly well-developed mind which became very important for the work she later did. She was, as I said, a fundamentalist Christian as a young person. Her experience in India when she was about 20, I guess, very young, very um, receptive to a totally different culture and way of life, really was the beginning of her spiritual revolution. She revolved, uh, you could say, turning from the narrow fundamentalist perspective to a, a spiritual consciousness which became completely inclusive in her later years. She fell in love when she was in India with a British uh, officer in the British forces. He was not of her class and at that time so supposedly she had a normal life. Let's see. That was a, <laughs> a huge issue for them. The only way their families could deal with this mixed marriage, as they probably would have called it, was to send the young couple off to America. So her husband and Alice came to the United States. He studied to become a um, minister in what we call the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church. Then they moved to California, where he had um, parishes in various small towns in rural California. They had three small daughters, but all was not what it seemed to be on the surface, because, as you say, he was an abusive husband, he had a violent temper, and um, I think the whole thing culminated. I would love for this to be, to be reverse speeched, like her whole interview reversed with him throwing her down a flight of stairs and uh, it was eventually concluded by the bishop who oversaw her husband's um, work that they had to live apart. Divorce at that time was just not sanctioned by the church but um, there was no way that she could remain in that marriage and that was at the beginning of World War I so she was separated from her husband without any money, no access to the money of her family back in Britain due to the war. She became um, a worker in a sardine canning factory and keep in mind that this was a, a privileged uh, woman from a very aristocratic background. What about you, Sarah? What was the catalyst that set you on your spiritual quest? I'd have to think back many, many years. I suppose it was um, something that grew out of an early aspiration to be of service. In my limited experience with people who have converted from traditional religions to more esoteric or New Age type practices, there's usually one thing each individual can pinpoint that made them have that aha moment and convince them to take up the new practice. Can you pinpoint something in Alice Bailey's teaching, one thing in particular that gave you that moment of awakening? I don't think I can. It was more of a gradual process of um, realizing that the mind has to be active if one is going to make any contribution to the world, that a, a willing emotional nature is not enough. And uh, the discovery of meditation, I would say, was pivotal, but I can't say that it was... And her voice sounds so gentle, like... It's a wonderful voice, like a older woman's voice, you know, with... She sounds very gentle and, you know, and calm. I don't know. I don't know. But it sounds like, you know, let's just, you know... Like her voice sounds very calm, you know? And remember, like, maybe it's a cover of a cover. Who knows? Who knows? You can only know the more information you gather. That's it. <laughs> Confined in a particular breakthrough realization. Not in my case. So let me read something Blavatsky wrote. Quote, It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, and this without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity. Do you know what this really means, and do you think Bailey was... <laughs> 
so inspired by this sentiment that she named what has now been renamed or rebranded as the Lucius Trust, the Lucifer Publishing Company back in the 1920s. If I understand the statement of Blavatsky about Satan, that's another term for Saturn, which is one of the yep. planets. Well, Quasi Luminous uh, has said about uh, Saturn and all that shit. From the president of Lucis Trust. Look, I'm not even like saying Lucis Trust is good, but I'm just investigating. That's it. In the um, study of esoteric astrology, there. I'm not saying they're good or bad. You know, I'm just investigating. This is what people do. This is what people should do. <laughs> There are, I believe, seven sacred planets. Saturn is she's the planet she's that is connected. She's explaining the planets now. You know, that they're not actually solid. But, of course, she's going to mention some globe Earth ideas because she's a glober. Possibly. Who knows? With the distribution or the working out of karma, the law of karma, which is really um, just another term for the law of cause and effect, Time. it's utterly benign in its ultimate working out, even though karma can be painful to the individual undergoing the process. And that's why Blavatsky said Satan or Saturn is... Um, well, how did you put it? It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, and this without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity. Well, if I understand wickedness her, her and language depravity. without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity, she's saying not it's not necessarily associated with uh, wickedness and depravity as we normally think of Satan, the devil. Saturn is the planet of um, a karma, which is the great law of equilibrium, the restoration of harmony and balance. That's another way to look at cause and effect. It's the restoration of equilibrium, which can only be good. Now, the reference to Lucifer comes from Blavatsky's um, description of Lucifer in the accurate sense of the... So having that we're in between, maybe we're in between... You know, like like the colors, you know, they all gradually go like the frequencies, the colors, they gradually, you know, turn to each other. So in reality, they are all each other, but it's just different versions of each other, like like material, like our material is the lowest frequency of spirit and spirit is the highest frequency of matter. So matter is the lowest frequency of spirit and spirit is the highest frequency of matter. So they're all in the same. So we could be on that middle ground of like, you know, good and evil, a balance. Looking at the term wickedness in a different way. I'm not saying she's good. I'm just trying to see it like I'm just trying so hard to like figure it out. And you kind of figure it out a little bit. You know, because like, oh, someone hears wickedness and they're like, okay, wickedness and all our glory. Me, I'm trying to understand why they say that. Why? You have to keep asking. Why do you say wickedness? What does wickedness mean to you? You know, questions, keep asking questions, man. <laughs> Even if it's like dark, like wickedness. What do you mean wickedness? Explain. Term which is a Latin, of Latin origin. It means literally light bearer. And it refers to a very obscure principle in the Ageless Wisdom, which is that the solar angels, the, the governing lords of the world, descended to our planet eons ago, bringing the principle of mind to what was then in those ancient, ancient times, essentially animal man, human beings with no mentality at all, no soul, just 
virtually living the existence of an animal. And these solar angels brought the principle of mind. That's the connection with Lucifer, light bearer, bringing the light of mind to our world. So Lucifer to Blavatsky was one of the great sacrificial beings who descended to earth. That's where we get the idea of the fall as John Milton, I think it was the British poet John Milton, wrote about the fall of the angels. That was the descent of the solar angels to earth as an act of sacrifice on our behalf. So you can see if you even have a willingness to consider this doctrine, how skewed it has been by the uh, more modern connotation of evil and Satanism and corruption. It's, it's not seen that way at all in the ageless wisdom. So Alice and Foster Bailey came out of the theosophical tradition, as I said. I believe Foster even was the editor of a theosophical magazine that they called Lucifer. So they probably thought Lucifer, light bearer, was a good name for their fledgling publishing company when they started to publish the books that Alice Bailey was writing, the books they saw as bringing light to humanity. But within two or three years, they decided to change the name of the company to Lucis Publishing Company. Lucis being from the same Latin term meaning of light, trust. Like I think a Lucius could be, maybe? of Light, Publishing Company of Light, and that's the name we've had since about 1925. Did they get flack <laughs> and that forced them to rebrand it? Not that I'm aware of. There's no record in our history of our work that um, explains why they changed the name. I have no idea why. It's only in more recent years with the internet and this um, sharing of ideas, no matter how cockamamie they might be, that the internet offers, that we hear more and more uh, from people who are concerned about our name. Anybody who's curious about it, you can go to our website, www.lucistrust.org, and you will find an article article explaining the origins of Lucifer and the history of the Lucis Trust, and that should put it to rest. Are there any other characters that are just as wise and illuminating as Lucifer? Perhaps is there a feminine spirit that um, the Lucis Trust speaks about? Well, the feminine... I see. Feminine spirit. Whoop. In principle, is um, embodied in people <laughs> like Eve, Isis, and Mary. Mary being the mother of Jesus, Bingo. Eve being the that biblical wife of Adam, Isis being one of the um, rulers from uh, Egyptian mythology. Generally, the feminine principle in the Ageless Wisdom is equated with matter, and matter, according to Blavatsky, is spirit on its lowest level, and spirit is matter here here she's do, uh this videos are uh, by someone criticizing them so that's why they're putting this goat head but it's supposed to be the other way it's supposed to be right side up like the pentagram this is uh this is the other side of the pentagram on its highest level, and the two are one. It's not correct to see matter as uh, contaminated and um, evil and spirit as the only good. The whole objective, uh, especially in the coming age, is to see the emergence of spirit and matter in perfect union so that life on earth becomes an accurate expression of God's plan as it exists in the mind of God. To bring through that plan on earth is to merge spirit with matter. The feminine principle is the receptive principle, the masculine principle being the spirit or active agent, but nothing is accomplished without the feminine principle carrying it through and bringing it to birth. Going back to, I guess, astronomy or astrology, <laughs> or the blend of both, somewhere in my travels I, I thought Lucifer was said to be a representative of the sun and Isis the moon. Yes, I've heard uh, Isis equated with the moon. Here I'm showing my own ignorance. I really haven't studied um, this aspect that you've just brought up very deeply. Lucifer associated with the sun? Well, the name means light bearer. The sun is the source of light on every level of existence, not just in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. So that sounds logical to me. Uh, the Ageless Wisdom says that 
solar angels, including Lucifer, came from the planet Venus, which is close to the sun, but more spiritually isn't, advanced than isn't, our planet uh, Venus Earth, feminine apparently, in nature? bringing the principle of mind to man. The arcane school. Uh, this is kind of maybe being too simplistic, but could you give us a laundry list of what the teachings are. The Arcane School was um, one of two of Alice Bailey's um, spiritual contributions. The One of them was the writing of the 24 books of Ageless Wisdom, which are published over her name. The other was the uh, establishing of the Arcane School, which she began in the early 1920s and which exists still today. It functions as a correspondence school for students all over the world. Lucis Trust is a non-governmental organization that has an affiliation with the UN. How does your esoteric practice interface with the figures and policies of world government? It's a bit of a reaching question, <laughs> but I thought I'd give it a shot. That's all right. In some circles who don't know very much about our work, they have accused us of being in favor of a one-world government. That's not the case at all. We don't believe for a minute that there's any one system of government that would suit the whole world, cultures and society. Okay, so here... So here, pretty much, she's uh, saying her view about the New World Order and United Nations. <laughs> Ladies are different, and it's the right of nations to choose their own form of government. The term one world government is much more subjective in its significance in the books of Alice Bailey. It doesn't mean a political system that uh, nations would follow, but rather a kind of a spiritual view or perspective that sees the coalescing of all the nations of the world in unity. And that's what the United Nations stands for. People expect the UN... So pretty much we gotta give them a bigger fucking amount of people than the UN. We gotta be bigger than their board. <laughs> Who knows? That'll be fucking interesting if that plays out like that. to solve problems and take a stand, except when it comes to one's own nation, and then the UN should stay out of it. The UN isn't a form of government, it's a platform for the governments of the world to come together and try to work out in common ground a solution to problems. A fairly successful resolution might be... We know that the UN doesn't have any solutions for us. We are the solution. Us, the people, are the solution. Us, the 144,000, and the, and the biggest number that no one could even count of. You know, that is going to do bigger change. It's not the UN. the way they are approaching the problems in um, the Middle East that have been developing since the turn of the year. Although, again, not everybody would agree with, say, the stand taken in Libya or in Bahrain or whatever. But we have always supported the United Nations for its spiritual objectives, which are to provide a meeting place for them. Yeah, but they're not, they're not actually... Like in their in their ha talking and shit, they're actually so according to them, they're in the social economic portion. So they got bread, I think. Who knows? That could be a possibility. <laughs> but they're not really directly involved with the UN. They're just affiliated with the economic and social aspect of the UN. You know. Let's see though. Let's keep researching. The nations of the world to come together. There has to be some common ground if humanity is going to work its way out of uh, the problems of the world. And the UN is the best thing we've got. It's not perfect, but name one other global organization. You can't. We have to work with what we have. The UN. Well, she says we have to work with what we have. How about if we have 144,000 at least people? Willing to bring heaven on earth even higher. You know, the light bearer. 
going from here to an extreme push to the next level if they say that that's what they have in mind then it shouldn't be an issue it's more will be more than the UN we'll be we'll have more people you know of course you know and peacefully gather and you know that'll be pretty interesting it's just an idea <laughs> That's what I'm intending in my brain. You know, I don't know how it's going to happen. But it's just in my head. I'm playing with the idea. Freedom of thought, you know, thinking, just thinking. And it's no better than its member states. And its member states are reflective of the consciousness of humanity in its present condition, which is imperfect. But let's say there uh, was such a thing as a new world order one world government globalist agenda that sort of thing do you think the teachings of the arcane school would be the ideal teaching to bring out spirituality and what we would need to have a successful one world view well i would elaborate on that we need to be bigger than the un you know like a real united nations not like a representative one representation you know thousands of all cultures. That idea by not giving the arcane school the credit, I would say the teachings or the principles of the ageless wisdom, yes, are enough to provide at least um, a template for the world to live in more harmony and unity. Those principles being a love of truth, a sense of justice as being uh, something all human beings are entitled to, a spirit of cooperation, a sense of personal responsibility on the part of every human being. Well, pretty much, Lucius, you know, they're representing the Black Sun, but they're not saying it like how we know, like what the Black Sun is and Lucifer and all that. But pretty much his organization represents, is the, is the worldly representation of what we know. And a realization. And people are like, oh, um, that... That there's no such thing as a new world order or all this shit, you know. Clearly, there's a part of the UN, a part, is associated with Lucius Trust. And they have spiritual ideals and, you know, Luciferian ideals, you know. So, they're, they're involved somehow. Hello, wake, wake up a little bit, please of the goal being the common good, the good of the whole. Those are very generalized principles, but I would think that all intelligent, decent people could at least give lip service to, to those principles. I know you're not supposed to uh, lobby or interfere with any kind of political movements. But have you uh, been with the UN for how many years is it? Oh, I think the World Goodwill has been affiliated with the United Nations Department of Information probably from the beginning, which was, I think, in the early 50s. Do you think Alice Bailey's teachings in any way might have influenced any of the Secretary Generals or the Ambassadors? Well, I don't know if her teachings specifically have influenced them, but certainly the larger Ageless Wisdom has been, I think, um, influencing the consciousness even back with the first Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld. He was a deeply spiritual man. If you read his book, Markings, it's just full of spirituality. Uta is revered even today for his deep spirituality. He was a practicing Buddhist, but utterly inclusive in his um, view of human beings and his openness to other spiritual truths. Robert Mueller, who was an undersecretary general for many years, again had a true global vision of humanity that was um, not confined by nationalist goals or objectives, he himself being the product of warfare in his home region of Alsace-Lorraine, which was totally 
torn between France and Germany, he knew personally how nationalistic thinking can cause such suffering. And probably there have been many other people in the UN who have been truly conditioned by spiritual values. I don't want to name too many of them because I think that gets into the area of personal belief, but you can recognize them by the quality of the thought and by the nature of their worldview. So we do reach out to the people of the UN and we find that many of them are very conscious of having a spiritual mission in the work they do. And they need our support. They are working in very... Well, now she's like talking about the UN and that shit. But like I said, we gotta give her something bigger than the UN. More people, I, I think. challenging circumstances and when you think about it the people in the UN are on the front lines facing the most critical problems of yeah on the, they're, they're on the front line of a fake fucking world <laughs> human experience on a daily level they need our support <laughs> let's look at life's lessons through the lens of Alice Bailey's writings and start off with that one question that's a cliche but what is life and why are we here? That's certainly the big question, isn't it? The best I... This lady is talking is not even Alice Bailey herself. So who knows if they have like different ideals. You know? Like how, how do we know that this lady is representing Alice Bailey truthfully? You know? So definitely I want to get into Alice Bailey and her life and her books and, you know, Blatsky. Because that's, like, good information. It's, like, really the occult of, like, what these people, like, dabble into. You're learning what the high occult, the occultists supposedly are learning. And they lay it out there for you. They really lay it out for you there, like you know, putting truth and putting uh you know truth in plain sight, you know. Ten more minutes, guys. What I can say is that we are here to develop a consciousness of relationship. We're told in the writings of Alice Bailey that we live in a solar system, in a universe that is governed by the second ray of seven rays, the second ray being the ray of love. And this okay. is working out to develop in the heart. human consciousness as it evolves, as a sense of relationship, of being a part of something much greater than an individual individual self. And the whole progress of the spiritual path for anyone is to steadily expand the consciousness to understand or incorporate larger and larger awareness of a wholeness which if you are religious you call God. If you're not religious you might refer to it as a basic energy. But we are not isolated islands. We are living fragments of a deity which is can only be described as a synthesis, a wholeness. This realization comes very slowly and only over time and evolution. It's not something you can just sit in a corner and figure out after a little bit of effort. It's an evolution. See half lies, you know, I'm talking about evolution. But we know what evolution really is, you know. Like, I would say that's kind of evolving, you know, in a bit, like, transcending when you go to the holy waters, to the north, you know, the holy grail, that's kind of like transcending, right? 
evolutionary progression. We see it as something that cannot occur in one lifetime. That's why the idea of continuity of life is so fundamental to uh, the ageless wisdom. That saying you only go around once, not so, in my opinion. We have lived and will always live, Yolo. but in a developing you sense. You only go around and once. Each time with a greater sense of um, awareness of our life being a mere fragment within a larger whole. That's the best I can put it. Romantic love. Does Alice Bailey have any theories as to why at certain points in our lives we find ourselves deeply connected to a stranger? I suppose she would say there's an, a sense of affinity or affiliation on the level of the soul. And probably that's true, that when we meet people whom we haven't known before, but we sense uh, a connection with them, if it's an enduring relationship, it's going to be something that is a link between souls. If it's a passing affinity that comes and then dissipates, she would probably say it was the harmony between two personalities. So the depth is measured uh, in terms of its ability to endure or not, but we are more harmonious with some people than others according to our psychology and our ray makeup, the seven rays that govern all forms of manifestation, power, love, intelligence, harmony, knowledge, devotion, and uh, order or organization. These are all different lines of development that we are synchronized with our fellow human beings depending on how they are conditioned by them. If we believe, for example, that we are a second ray soul, we're probably going to find ourselves responding to other people who share a similar conditioning. I listened to one of your audio newsletters wherein the speakers discussed nourishment. Almost at the conclusion of the presentation, the gentleman made remarks about the overpopulation of the planet. He said something to the effect that we should employ kind and gentle measures to control our world. And we know the world population is bullshit. <laughs> population instead of experiencing a more harsh solution from mother nature then he left it at that and left me wanting for more <laughs> so it, it begs the question what is the lucius trust position on how we how and why we should control the world population we don't really have a formal policy or point of view the implication of that statement you just read is that yeah they don't give a fuck about the world population they probably know that that's bullshit too don't give a fuck. Mother Nature takes care of overpopulation through famine, through war, through uh, uh, all kinds of natural disasters. But war isn't really Mother Nature. Yeah, but the implication is that if we don't take care of overpopulation, other circumstances will do it for us. But I personally think that anyone living in the West, and particularly in a developed country like the United States, had better be very cautious about judging overpopulation and saying, well, look, our society, we only have 2.1 children, whereas other societies have 6 or 8. A child born in America is going to consume far more of the world's resources than a child born in a developing country. And so we can't just say other countries need to come. We know all this resources, resources is bullshit. The Holy Grail and, and Flat Earth is going to solve all this shit according to some research back on their population. If we aren't also doing something about our overconsumption of the planet's resources, doesn't the United States consume something like 25% of the world's resources? And we're only a small, what, 5% of the world's population? That's terrible. I think that's the point we should focus on and not overpopulation. Did Alice Bailey have any particular views on the prophets who have come into the world throughout history? As I recall from her writing, she viewed them as forerunners who are the advance guard, we could say, bringing teaching or sometimes warnings. Uh, for example, Isaiah in the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament prophets. Nowadays, I think the prophets are coming more in group form 
and we see them active in the world through just about every area of human experience. They're the people who have an insight into the developing trends of the world and can help to warn and guide humanity. You can hear their voice in economics, in science, in religion, in education, in culture. They're the forerunners, and they're trying to chart a new course for humanity. Their voice is becoming more and more prominent, I think, and thanks to modern technology, more universally accessible. But is it not so that Lucius Trust, Alice Bailey, was looking for specifically the prophet Maitreya? The Maitreya is a being, an entity that is expected by the Buddhists. It's the reincarnation of the Buddha as the world teacher, the final Buddha, he whose name is Kindness, we're told, and he's expected as a an avatar to lead humanity forward into the next stage of human evolution. The Ageless Wisdom views the Maitreya as the Buddhist understanding of the same concept that the Christian views as Christ, that the Hindu understands as the Kalki avatar, the Jewish person looks for the Messiah. It's the world teacher, and the writings of Alice Bailey say this entity will come, this time for the whole of humanity, not for any particular group, but for the whole. Were there not specific dates? I can't bring to mind a gentleman who was, I guess, the... PR person for the coming of the Maitreya, but he had some specific dates out there, and unfortunately, it, it never materialized. No, Alice Bailey has never set a specific date. It's forecast that this world teacher will reappear sometime in the 21st century, but I think the conditions have to be created by humanity. She spells this out quite clearly in her book, The Reappearance of the Christ, that before this world teacher can return, there has to be a true sharing of resources on the part of humanity and the growth of goodwill in the world. And as well, we have to see some signs that the political and religious systems are willing to clean house. And I think we can certainly look at what's going on, say, in the Catholic Church and in the political field and realize that there is house cleaning going on. And that's all very positive. But a true sharing we have to demonstrate a greater growing goodwill. I think it's coming. When you look at the response, say, to the tsunami in Southeast Asia, to Haiti, to... Probably all factor fabricated events, probably caused by HARP. Who the fuck knows? I have to do more research on that. Japan, to the victims of Katrina, we do see a growing sense of sharingness and compassion. So we're getting there. But those are the conditions humanity has to provide before, to put it frankly, it would be worth the time and energy of the world teacher to reappear. Who was this gentleman that was predicting the dates and how did he get into the mix and some kind of association with Lucius Trust? He's never been associated with the Lucius Trust. Um, you're speaking of Benjamin Krim and we have no involvement in his work. Exactly. nor he in ours. What is expected to happen when the Maitreya returns? If we see this as a continuity that was last Maitreya's embodied Buddhist. in the person of the Christ 2,000 years ago, like at the, that time like he Christ, anchored the, the an Buddhist energy Christ. of love that had never before been present in the human experience. He was the embodiment of perfect divine love. We're told that when this entity, this avatar, returns, that he will bring humanity a new understanding of the spiritual will. And I find that fascinating to think about. We feel so helpless and so befuddled about finding a resolution of human problems and the idea that this new understanding or this new energy of the spiritual will will be anchored in the world when the avatar returns is I find enormously hopeful and positive. But first we have to demonstrate that the energy of love is sufficiently anchored in human consciousness to make us able to bear a greater spiritual will. You can imagine a powerful will without sufficient love would be wrongly used. Alright guys, hope you got some insight. 
look into Lucy's trust, get into Alice Bailey, you know, and learn about the other side to better make a better answer in your head, to come up with a good answer, what you feel comfortable doing, like that answer that you feel uh, comfortable with. Well, take care.